Rose. Hi. Now, I know you're probably wondering one of two things. Did she join a biker gang, an exclusive biker gang, or did she get a car? Now, you'd only be right on one of them, and I hope that you chose wisely. If you chose, she's got a car, you're right. There's no biker gang for me, right, Ole? Mm -hmm. No, uh, I am actually upstate right now. Where I'm originally from. I had to come home for a couple of reasons. And with coming home comes the benefit of being able to show you some literary places. Today I'm going to show you two places that I think are pretty significant as far as someone esteemed lived there. And another place where a very famous book takes its inspiration from. So yeah, without further ado, let's get going. Let's do this thing. You ready, Ole? for the secret history. So I'm gonna take you on a little baby tour so that you can finally put a picture to those famous words. All right, so let's start this tour. What? I'm literally filming a voiceover right now, Oleg. Um, but this is the main campus, this is the main building that we have going on. And if you look to your right, I think that that might be housing. But can't you imagine Bunny just flopping through here, causing chaos, the twins being destructive? Oh, God. And we are back to a more slightly secluded area for recording. Um, this is what I imagine they're learning a little bit of Greek in this area, you know. And that's me. No, just kidding. Um, but can't you just see them walking through this? This is where I imagine maybe Francis' storm is. Maybe. I'm not sure. Oh, I had an audition at this theatrical building and I didn't get the parts. So we'll just drive past there. Nothing to see there at all. Nothing at all. This is actually a building that they don't use. It is relatively new, so I can't imagine that it was on campus when Donna Tart was doing her studies here so we'll just kind of discard it for now and pretend that maybe there was something else there but this this my friends oh you know this is the inspiration for francis's weekend home i look at this and i think secret history baby this is actually the music building at bennington college right now but it does have the oldest authentic kind of feel to what i imagine donna tart was experiencing yeah oh and these guys were following us the whole time so we just came back from our second favorite thing in the world. <laughs> second favorite besides reading. Did some thrifting. Thrifting in upstate is the best thing you can ever do with your life because it has the best stuff for cheap and nobody knows what they have. Like, do you want to talk about what you got me? Just show show the camera and you got to do the like, you got to do the vlogging hand. Like you a... see that? Look at those. My size baby. I'm trying to figure out what year is that, yeah. You gotta do the hand, you gotta do the hand. What hand are you talking about? You gotta do the, the hand. I'm fine with that. Okay. So there you go. And then, what did we pick up? Well, how much were they? Ten dollars, right? Ten bucks. And then we picked up number one dance album. This is like a very quintessential um, church in Bennington, Vermont. You can see it is a stunning white chapel. Absolutely stunningly beautiful. And if you go in here, there is a nice little cemetery. Can you guess who's gonna be buried in here? I'll give you a nice countdown. Five, four, three, two, 
one. Could you guess it? You still have a little bit more time because I'm not there yet. <laughs> Here it is. Oh, yeah. One last chance to make your guess, because here is who I am talking about. Robert Frost. Happy National Poetry Month. Robert Frost is buried in Bennington, Vermont, and it looks like his whole lineage is here as well. So Oleg and I are currently in Manchester, Vermont. I'm about to hit one of my favorite bookstores of all time. Manchester United? Manchester United. That guy, yeah, baby. Hello. Oh, that was a tree falling, and I just got it. <laughs> so that was a tree falling. <laughs> oh, wow, that's perfect timing. So I'm actually on a walk right now, and I tried to film this while walking, but I got my I got really sick. So I figured if I got sick then you guys watching it would also get sick. We're not on that much of an incline. My phone is just slowed down. Yes, while on a walk, I figured that I would touch base with you about the book that I'm reading. I should be talking about books, right? I feel like this entire vlog so far has just been a lot of me showing you books and showing you places where I buy books and showing you kind of literary moments in this area that I'm in right now. But I am reading a book and it is very poignant and it is very perfect for what I am doing. I'm reading The Philosophy, A Philosophy of Walking by Frederick Gross. No, I'm I'm saying that name correctly. Could easily look it up, but will I? No, this is my own experience. I just finished it today, actually, and it inspired me to go on a walk. I'm a huge lover of walking. And that is definitely Frederic Gross's stance as well. So the book is essentially a looking into how philosophers, how poets, how writers that have so heavily put their time into figuring out the art of walking and how it has affected their work and their mindset. Oh wow, it's, I hope you can still hear me. And other, and their lifestyle in general. How walking has become kind of this staple of how they live. Frederick Gross also puts his own voice into certain chapters as well and talking about how it has explicitly affected him. And just, he also goes into different people's approaches to walking. Like there's the pilgrimage, there is the stroll, there is the walking through gardens, there's using it as a form of like finding mates. It's a very strange book and it's 200 pages long but it definitely takes a little while. I think every single chapter has something completely different in it and for Frederic to have taken that much time to establish a huge foundation on the uh, meditations of walking is insane. He obviously loves it. I love it. I wouldn't suggest it to everyone, but I think that it is a really good book for someone who wants to maybe adapt that lifestyle. As always, I'll do a final wrap up on it at the end, but that is what I'm thinking about right now and where my mind is at. Look at this. I'm on a rock right now, so if I slip, I'm gonna I'm gonna freak out. Oleg's waiting for me, so I'm gonna go catch up with him. Was she lying? No, she wasn't. There is the tree. We can all have a moment. Damn, that's wild. Look at that! Oh my god. All right.
hello. Made it to the end of the video. I'm actually in my old childhood bedroom. It was not decorated this way. It's become the spare room, but it is kind of nostalgic to be here and think of all the books that I read, all of the life-changing novels that I was reading at 15 years old. <laughs> I figured I would, uh, since it's the end of the vid, you know, doing the final wrap-up of the book. Unfortunately, I only read one book this week, but as you can tell, I was doing a lot of other things, and I felt like this book was perfect for where I was, like what sort of mental state I was in. I was in a very clear mindset. I feel like talking about walking is a perfect book to just kind of cap off the week. I didn't want to be too aggressive in my reading because I wanted to relax. And not that reading doesn't relax me, but I do try to actively read as opposed to passively read. So let's just talk about that book. Let's look at this beauty. Let me let me start by breaking down the book. As I touched on before, Frederick Gross has this divide between the way that he writes, where he has an emphasis on philosophers, writers, poets, things like that in their relationship to walking, and then he also brings in his own sort of ruminations on the sport, if you will. He talks about Nietzsche and how his relationship to walking was this sort of convalescence sort of thing. He suffered from multiple ailments and he used walking as a way to heal himself. He found it as the ultimate healing for multiple ailments that he had and he wasn't happy unless he was walking. And then it goes into Rousseau, how it was sort of this escapism. He became kind of an outcast towards the end of his life because he put so much emphasis on walking and being at peace in his own self. And you have Thoreau and that's kind of like, for him it became this like receptive chronic habit. Like he had to do it all the time. And it was, you know, some of his best musings were when he was walking. And then you have Rimbaud, who I wasn't entirely familiar with and his whole Whole lifestyle was just he was a vagabond he was constantly moving and it just his relationship to walking was an absolute lifestyle and this escapism as well at the same time it was his it was a lifeline for him he didn't feel like a human unless he was constantly moving and achieving and doing these crazy things and then you have Kant he goes into Kant and again how it was this daily routine he was a very organized person and he had his day planned down to the last bit and walking was one of those things he wasn't a, a, a massive walker he wasn't going on these epic journeys but he always made time in his day to do it and how he kind of meditates on that sort of idea. And then the last one that he gets into is Gandhi, and that of course is just this explosive chapter on how walking was the foundation for how he became who he was and how it was this incredible meditative state. That in itself is probably my favorite part of the book, reading about all of these separate people and how they had these intense tie-ins to walking. That was probably the best part of the book. Now when Frederick Gross goes into his own ideology on these sorts of things, it kind of gets a little bit repetitive like he has certain chapters dedicated to certain aspects of walking like there's one on pace and slowness and eternities actually that one has a great passage hold on wait one second a day will surely come when we will just stop worrying stop being taken over and imprisoned by our chores while knowing very well that we have invented most of them and posed them on ourselves just but it's, again, it's this huge philosophical orbit that he's circling around and it encapsulates so many different things. Overall, there's there's beautiful passages in it. There's another one where he's talking about solitudes and the just being alone when you're walking. And he says, in that sense, you aren't alone because when walking, you earn the sympathy of all the living things that surround us, trees and flowers. That is why you go walking sometimes, just to pay a visit to green glades, groves of trees, violet shaded valleys. You think after a few days, months, or years, it's really been too long since I went there last. It's expecting me. I should go there on foot. And slowly the road, the feel of the ground underfoot, the shape of the hills, the height of the trees, all come back to you. They are acquaintances. To me, that almost makes me want to cry. I think if you are a walker, this rings true on so many different levels. If it is a hobby, if it is a lifestyle that you have, I suggest picking this up just because I think you'll learn so much about yourself in these words or you know so much about who you are, but these words make it very final and concrete. I'm not gonna give a score to this. I don't think that you can score a philosophy book. I think that if you take something away from it, then it's serving its purpose. And I definitely took something away from this. This. I enjoyed this book a lot. I highly suggest it if you love walking and if you don't, it's fine too. Maybe you'll find a chapter or you'll find a philosopher or someone that you didn't know previously and you will be intrigued enough to start learning about them. I like it.
All right. Oh, I'm sorry that this wasn't that much with books, but I hope that you enjoyed all this bookish stuff and I will catch you guys in New York City. I'm going back tomorrow. Today is Sunday and I'll be back on Monday, but I will catch you guys then. Bye.